start by asking you quickly, I mean, given what um, Ray has just said, do you agree or disagree? Um, what do you make of it? Where do you see the current um, state of the markets right now? Perhaps, Ken, if you start. Well, certainly the world that, that we live in, which is um, both debt and equity, um, have been, um, frankly, white hot. I mean, if you look at the, the level of deal activity, the amount of capital that's been raised in the private markets, uh, the numbers are extraordinary. And, and I mean, to me, the interesting part is obviously you, you've seen tremendous capital inflows, both in terms of private equity and private debt. You've seen tremendous deal activity. Uh, we're at record levels again, which is, you know, some extent hard to believe that, you know, given where we were with COVID. So, that, you know, so lots of good things to report there in terms of um, deal activity, obviously purchase multiples up significantly. But I think the real question to, to ask is how did we get here, right? If you think about where we were just a year ago, um, people are grounded, working from home, a uh, lot of concern about kind of long-term economic growth. Um, and by the end of last year, the markets came, the private markets and public markets came storming back. Um, and we've been on a run ever since. And in many respects, it's businesses and companies that, you know, have, have benefited from COVID. Um, and I think that transformation has spurred tremendous growth. And, and we're certainly still on, a path, uh, on that path today. So I would say, you know, I'm quite optimistic about where we are today and, and about the level of economic growth and activity. And, and certainly the private equity and private credit worlds are as well. Um, before I turn to Bennett, I mean, do you see anything that could derail that in the next year or so? Are you worried about either some kind of spasm around debt, the impact of the Fed raising rates, um, you know, 4% inflation if we have that, or US-China jitters, or, you know, more, what about a debt, um, debt ceiling debacle? If you ask me, and I, you know, Ben and obviously weigh in as well, I think from my perspective, it, inflation is probably the big threat. You know, I, I think if we were to see, you know, a, a, a significant amount of inflation that in fact what we're seeing today, which is being called transitory by, by most economists, including, including, including ours, becomes, you know, a much bigger issue, I think that could cause a fair amount of disruption, you know, in, in the private markets, the cost of financing, uh, could obviously rise dramatically as well, and I think that could temper valuations, which would roll out through the through the stock market. I, I don't see that happening right now. I think we will see some modest inflation, but uh, that would certainly, to me, be the biggest threat: is is if we simply continue to outspend our means, if we don't recognize that at some point the stimulus and, and the level of government support does need to, to moderate itself, if we continue on this binge of spending. I think at some point it will start to drive a more more significant inflationary environment, and and to me that's the biggest threat right now. Is four percent is four percent significant? No. Okay. No. Well, that's four percent is not significant. I, three to four percent, I think, is you know I I, I think we all prefer you know lower than that, but I don't think three to four is significant. But you know eight nine ten is, and and I think that starts to become a, a major issue. I don't think I don't think we're going to get there, but I think if you were asking me the biggest threat, that, that's what I would say. Right. Bennett, what is your perspective? Well, one, um, throughout my um, GSO career, when people would ask me about macroeconomic trends, I would simply say, read what Ray Dalio says. Uh, <laughs> I think that's called a cop-out. Yeah, complete cop-out. But when you think about it, you know, he's got 100 PhDs on his payroll, and we have none. Um, I think he knows more than we know. So I, I, I do pay a lot of attention to like what uh, Bridgewater has to say about those kinds of matters. I, I would say the current environment would be defined by complacency. You know, typically what drives investment activity is either you see value in the market or there are technical considerations, i.e. you have a lot of cash and you've got to put it in the market. Now, who out here thinks there's a lot of value in the market? Show of hands. Anyone? Okay, so well, they're either asleep so, or they're completely de you okay, know, in so, agreement. Okay, so um, I, I assume there are some shy people, and there are probably some more people. There, there could be more, but the general consensus is, um, wow, like what else am I going to do with my cash? What's my alternative? Um, those are technical matters, and and that's what I find troublesome. 
That's what drives the complacency. No one has lost money by owning financial assets in the last, we had a mark to market for about three months last year because of COVID and then it all came roaring back. So as long as you kept investing because you had the cash, you were rewarded. And that's usually when you start making your worst mistakes. So um, I, I, I think it's always a little scary when, when the markets are driven so ferociously by the fact that people are, are flush with cash and more cash is coming into the market as investors around the world, both institutional and retail, are searching for yield. And I think that's the environment that we're in. I must say, I'm often reminded when I hear comments like that of a um, comment from a very wise European um, central banker a few years ago. He said, what central bankers really pray for are Goldilocks shocks, which occur just frequently enough to keep everyone on their toes. Goldilocks shocks are just big enough to and they allow, remind people that you can't be complacent, but not too big to bring down the whole system. And in a way, we've been missing a Goldilocks shock for a while. Maybe Evergrande will be one. but um. Maybe, but you know, everyone's bought on the dips for the last 10, 11, 12 years and have been rewarded. And I think that will continue until uh, something becomes more than just a moderate um, um, uh, revaluation. And fundamentally, we, 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 we need that kind of correction. It's healthy. I mean, it's, it's, it's what markets require. Uh, for going to get out of this mode. So what does this mean for private markets in particular? Because you know you have this wall of cash coming in. You have, you might say, a bit of complacency. Um, how is the asset class evolving at the moment? Ken, do you want to give us your thoughts? Well, you know, I think in just to follow on what, what Ben said, I mean, I think that in part is why you are seeing the move to private markets. I think investors, both institutional and frankly retail, and we'll hear, you know, in the next panel from, from our iCapital friend and, 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 and obviously talk about what I feel is a tremendous move to, uh, you know, alternative assets in, in the wealth sector and by individual investors. But I think what you're seeing is investors are looking at the, the public markets and they're saying, gee, where can I find value? Where can I find yield? Where can I find return? And historically, private equity, uh, certainly the top managers have outperformed. If you look at private credit, the answer is, is the same. So, and obviously the hunt for yield continues. So I think when you think about um, uh, outperformance on a relative basis, when you look at uh, certainly uh, the, the lower volatility in the, in, the, in the private credit markets, and that played out last year, um, and, and frankly, the non-correlated non -correlated nature of, of, of alternative investments, I think we are in the early innings of a, a longer term uh, continued transition from pure public markets investing to alternatives. You see it in what, what the SEC is doing. You see it in what um, technology is bringing to individual investors. And you certainly see it um, in institutions. I remember a day, and, and, and Bennett it probably remembers the same, that. T 10 years ago, you would meet with a, a large pension plan and or public plan or even an endowment. And, you know, you'd have to try to fit in where private credit fit within their allocations. Gee, is it equities or is it fixed income? And, and, and today, almost all the institutional investors we talk to, you know, are allocating aggressively to to the private market. So I think uh, I think the growth prospects in our, our world look extremely bright and um, you know, I, I think that trend is, is absolutely going to continue. And the nice thing about it is, is that capital will, will go toward the investors that deliver performance. So in that sense, it's an efficient um, um, allocator of capital. The, the non-performers, the bottom quartile private capital managers are simply not going to survive. And the larger, scalable top performers will, will thrive. So I think that's a good thing. Bennett, would you agree? Uh, yeah, I do. I think that... Um the private markets, whether it's credit or private equity or real estate, offer a premium to the public market alternative. So if you're an insurance company and you're the CIO, you, you know, you can have a really tough job right now. You know, your model of, you know, 60, 40 uh, in public equities and in high grade fixed income, investment grade debt, 
you can't earn enough return to possibly meet your actuarial liability. So where do you go? And while um, you, you, you won't be able to get there in, in public markets, you know, you're kind of forced into, into private markets in many respects. And the private markets give you a premium today of call it, you know, 300 basis points, give or take, depending upon the asset class, to the comparable risk in the public markets. Now you give up liquidity and uh, there's a cost to that, but I think that trade-off of, you know, 300 basis points in private equity to, you know, possibly more for top quartile performance is sufficient that they're going to continue to get ever bigger allocations from the big institutions around the world. Yeah, and, and I would add that you know, in talking private credit, the vast majority of direct lending and private credit is floating rate. Mm -hmm. So in a rising rate environment, that 3 to 4% scenario you described, you do have an, you know, a built-in hedge there relative to, let's say, bonds. And I certainly agree with Ray that I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of the bond market right now. I think you're earning zero, the chances are you're going to lose money. I mean, that's where I see the bond market right now. So I think private credit offers a, a floating rate option and ability to, to, to hedge yourself against potential rising interest rates. So I, I think, you know, um, institutions are looking to, to, to get yield, and, and it's, a, it's a great way to, to achieve that. Right. I should say that if anyone wants to ask questions, once again, I think I've now got this machine figured out. So <laughs> do please um, send over any questions you'd like. But I'd like to pick you up on something you said, Ken, which was about the SEC. Tell us why the SEC's actions are important right now in relation to private markets. Well, I was referring to the fact that they are, are looking for ways to broaden access to alternatives. And, and there have been a number of moves uh, that, that now, you know, I think are in recognition that alternative assets, certainly in a, in a more modest quantity in, in individual portfolios, are, are something that is reasonable to, to allow. And so you're seeing that move in, um, you know, in, in starting now in 401ks and IRAs now looking to ha provide the ability to invest in, in private markets. And I, and I think that's a good thing. You know, from a, from a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, all of us as asset managers are are regulated by the SEC and where we all file uh, you know, with them. So I think the regulatory infrastructure and the asset management side is, is quite good now and quite robust. You know, all of us are, are annually reviewed you know, by the SEC and I, and I think that's appropriate. And, um, and, and I think that, that regulation as it relates to asset management um, you know, has, has done a pretty good job. Ben, would you agree? Because I mean, you know, certainly the SEC has delivered some quite big surprises recently to anyone in crypto, anyone dealing with SPACs, um, you know, there's a, quite a shift in tone from the SEC these days. Yeah, well, um, it wasn't that long ago where we used to read about from your paper, as well as many others, you know, shadow banking, the sinister appellation <laughs> for like what we were doing. Like we were, we were like, you know, uh, you know, operating under the cloak of darkness. Um, and I think the regulatory interest in, in, in at least in private debt uh, has waned. And they have forced risk into uh, investors who can price risk and who do not pre who don't present the contagion risk that a big bank can can you, you know you refer to the Lehman moment the the long term credit moment the AIG moment and the way the private lending industry has evolved. People raise funds; they're non-recourse to one another. You know, you can do a bad deal, you can jeopardize a individual fund, but there are not enough counterparties. There's not enough leverage in a fund that's going to cause some kind of chain reaction. Yeah. And I think that's healthy. I think that's where the, you know, the regulators were shrewd, and and they wanted this phenomenon to happen. The only people that don't like it are the incumbent commercial banks, right. because they lose market share. And I actually think they are making so much money right now, and they are so um, delighted by SPACs and M and A, and you know, these are good times to be to, to be a bank. They're not as focused on private lending. Um, but if I were them, I'd keep an eye on it, and I'd be knocking on the door of the regulator and say, "Hey, this just isn't fair." You know, today the private lending market's about a trillion dollars. If you took the, le the publicly traded syndicated loan and high yield bond market, kind of three, three and a half trillion. So 
private debt's now about 20, 25% of the overall activity. And I do think uh, it has the potential to attract more attention over time from the and regulator. It, and, it, and it's been growing dramatically. You know, I, I, think I mean, give us a sense of the growth rates and where, yeah. you, where you see it going. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Maybe, you know, we've been doing this long enough, so I guess we could have some perspective on, on how this has played out. But, you know, what Bennett alluded to is, is, is absolutely correct. I mean, if you look at where we've been, you know, 20, 25 years ago, the largest commercial banks dominated the lending to mid-sized companies. I mean, there were five or ten banks, and they owned the market, and they lent money, and the returns worked for them. You know, so we went through a phase of consolidation. We then went through a phase of regulation, you know, brought on by the, by, by the, the GFC. And, and the regulators, I think, quite properly recognized that, you know, they didn't want banks who were taking deposits, taking the kind of risk that they were taking in the capital markets. And what we have seen, uh, certainly over the last 10 to 15 years, is, is really the disintermediation of, of the banks in the market today. And I think folks would be you know, quite surprised, I, I would say, to learn that the largest lenders to mid-sized U.S. companies, the, you know, today the third largest uh, economy in the world overall, are almost exclusively non-bank lenders. So, so it is private credit managers that are financing billion-dollar transactions directly, and those private credit managers are managing institutional capital to do that and, and that really gets to, to Bennett's pause. I think that's a much more efficient place to put that business. And so I think, I think the regulators were, were actually very shrewd as well. I would agree with you. And what it's done is it's taken a lot of the risk out of the system, right? As opposed to a single bank holding a billion or $2 billion in credit risk. Today, if, if we commit to $500 million in a transaction, we have 26 separate funds that we manage. And that risk is now spread across a much wider uh, array of, of funds and investors. And I think that diversification of risk is a good thing. So I think private credit has moved to a much better place. But so you're saying there's about a trillion dollars of private lending compared to, I think you said, 3.5 trillion of publicly traded, traded credit. Loans and bonds. OK. Um, how big can it get? I mean, can we go to a world where we have basically you know, 2.5, 2.5, could private credit end up, you know, at some point overtaking publicly traded credit? Probably not. Um, you know, part of it is the decision making of a private equity sponsor of do I want to tap the public markets versus the private market? And, you know, it's more expensive doing a, a private market deal. But what's driven a lot of the growth in this trillion dollar number isn't the $100 million loan that Churchill gives to a mid-market company. It's actually these mega deals, these enterprise software, these high growth consumer facing businesses that are doing a, a, a billion dollar, $2 billion, $3 billion unitronche through, through private lenders. And if you're a TPG or you're a Vista Equity or you're Blackstone, historically the spread between the cost of money in the syndicated loan market with a high yield bond attached compared to a unit tranche, you know, might have been three or 400 basis points. So it's, it was expensive. Today, spreads have compressed in the private markets, actually more so than in the public markets. Yeah. So now the, 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 the cost of doing a private deal has come down a lot. So the, the question becomes, it's faster. You don't need a rating. You don't have to do a road show. You, Privacy. You, you, you stay private. private. Your deal team isn't bothered with, you know, three, you know, two month road show. You know, if I have to pay an extra hundred basis points for the convenience of all that, I'll do it. On a and, phone call or two. And that's what's given rise to some of these real mega deals that I, you know, that surprises me. Like five years ago, I would have said, you know, a billion dollar commitment. Like that felt like a lot. But in today's world, uh, just given the flows into the direct lending space, um, it's not a lot. Right. And, 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 and you know, they're, they're readily doable. Right. I see actually I've got a question saying, what is the capacity of private credit market? How large can it get relative to public markets and still function? I, I think the growth, we are in the early days. I, I believe we are in the early days of the growth potential for private markets. I mean, it's really only been in the last five years 
that, that larger institutions have now carved out private credit and made significant allocations to, to private capital. And, and I think as you look at the scale of those allocations, it's going to be driven by institutions. And, you know, it has been driven by institutions. But I think the big variable and the big potential here is, is, is wealth, retail, and the individual investor. Right. If, if those numbers start to turn in scale, I mean, historically, you really have only had the BDCs, which are a relatively small part of the market. But, but I think that the more we see the democratization of private capital, which we are on a path to do, um, I, I think that could accelerate. So I think it could get very, very significant. Think about it this way, Julian. If you're a private company trying to raise $500 million or a billion dollars, and, and one option is to go to the, the syndicated loan market and, and, and face all the challenges that Bennett just mentioned, or you can call one or two private capital managers and literally raise a billion dollars in, in a week or two with a commitment from two lenders that you really see as your partners in helping to finance the business going forward. I mean, one of the things that, that he didn't mention, which is a big issue, is frankly, when you do a syndicated loan deal, you might have 20, 30, 40, 50 investors. If you're growing your business, you've got to redo that every time you want to make, it, make a new deal. If you have two partners and they're pro both providing three or four hundred million dollars, you make phone calls, they come in, they do their work, you can raise another three or four hundred million dollars. So it is a much more efficient way to, to grow your business and to raise capital. Right. So I think the potential long term for growth um, is, is very, very significant. So last very quick question, we're almost out of time. Of course, one issue about being private, as you say, is you're not subject to public scrutiny. Um, you're not facing necessarily quite the same level of oversight in a world with radical digital transparency. And yet, can you afford to ignore ESG issues? Well, that's a good question, because public companies cannot. And why should there be a distinction when it comes to an ESG-related matter if a company is private or public? It, it should all be the same. So the, the private markets have been slower to adopt uh, various ESG initiatives. Um, ESG, by the way, is a euphemism for a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, used, I, I used to say that ESG stood for eye roll, sneer, and groan. Uh, um, yeah. And yeah. then I realized that actually the zeitgeist really was changing. Now ESG is really about risk management as much as activism and trying to, if you like, employ lateral vision, anthro vision, to see all the things that were outside the balance sheet which could end up tripping you up, like environmental risk, social risk, Except supply chain risk, et cetera. Yeah, so if I was starting a new business, I'd set up a DEI-oriented advisory group that can recruit candidates, uh, advocate for those, those candidates, um, be their mentors, uh, help with board selection. Uh, it's very hard today to find enough highly qualified, diverse candidates to, to meet the needs and, and um, it's a challenge. I, I, I just know at my firm uh, what, what's involved in trying to keep our group looking like our general population. And it, it, it's, it's really hard. But, you know, I, I would agree completely. And I, and I would argue that, that DEI and, 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 and the whole initiatives there, initiative there and, and frankly ESG more broadly, is good business. I mean, if, if you are investing in companies today, whether you're an equity investor or a credit investor in, in the private markets, our world certainly, you know, you need to pay attention to these issues. Our investors are, frankly, all over it, okay? Our, our largest investors are primarily in Europe today. And I can tell you that, you know, without exception, whether it's Scandinavia or, or, or the UK or continental Europe, all, they all want to talk about where you are in ESG. They all want to talk about where you are on DEI. They, they are, the investors are driving it. So make no mistake about it, just because you're private does not mean that you're not dealing with tremendous pressure from institutions who themselves have their constituents who are very focused on this. And I think that, that again, we are early days in this, but we are part of an initiative in the private equity, private equity and private credit world, the private capital world, to develop ESG standards that you know drive you know, real change in terms of the investments we make and the, you know, in, in, the, in the people we hire. So I think it is, you know, that, that out, of the, out of the COVID, you know, uh, environment that we've seen probably is one of the greatest positives 
that we've seen is a focus on how do we become more inclusive, how do we become more diverse, how do we focus on the climate and our environment and social governance, and, and, and I think that is with us to stay and something that smart private capital managers better pay attention to. Well, that's another way of saying that there's a hunt on right now for lateral vision and a wider perspective on how business and finance fits into society. I should say, by the way, that the Financial Times um, a couple of years ago created a platform, in fact, the first platform by a mainstream media group to look at the issues around sustainability and ESG. It's called Moral Money um, in a nod to Adam Smith and his theory of moral sentiments, which was the second half of his capitalist vision that often gets ignored, but now, of course, is coming back into fashion. And since we launched Moral Money, we've seen voracious reader interest because there really is something of a zeitgeist shift, um, not just in public markets, but as you say, increasingly in private markets too. So we'd love to hear more about that. But we are over time. So it just remains for me to say a very big thank you indeed for your thoughts. Um, thank you for matching Ray Dalio in terms of the interest and the points.